Okay, I'm gonna need some audience participation, okay? I'm gonna ask a question, and then I'm gonna need you guys to respond by raising your hand, okay? And I'm gonna need you guys to be a little bit more active than first service was today. I mean, because first service, I mean, it looked like they took an Ambien before they came to church. Like, <laughs> like maybe we need to pray for them. Like, it, it, was, it was rough. We love them, we love them, I love them. But uh, I'm gonna ask a question, I'm gonna need some audience participation. Now, here's the question. How many of you would say, I am humble. Let me see your hands. Where are my humble people at? Where's my humble people at? Now, do me a favor. Okay, put your hand down because you just lost all your humility. Like that's how, <laughs> that's how humility works. Like no one can ever say, I'm humble. <laughs> Everybody come look how humble I am. Hey, I wrote a book called I'm humble, and how you can be humble just like me. I got five simple ways for you to be humble just like me. No one can ever say I'm humble. Brandon Stacy, our leadership director, he's working on a book called How I'm So Humble, but so y'all can pray for him. But actually, funny enough, there was a guy, uh, a pastor, he's a good pastor, he wrote a book called Humility, his name's C.J. Mahaney, it's a great little book, you can go pick it up, it'd probably take you about two hours for you to read it, and it's all about humility, and here's what he writes, he says this, no one can ever say, I'm humble, the only thing we can say is this, we are proud people who are learning to humble ourselves, that okay? humility is Hard. We live in a culture that is only designed to tell you how great you are. Everything in our culture is all about you, how you can live your best life, how you can be great, and how you can be successful. It's all about your reputation, how you look, how you feel, what other people think about you. We live in a day and age where it's all about self. Everybody wants the promotion, the bigger car, the fancier house. We want the most Facebook friends, the most social media followers, and we post pictures on the internet so people can double tap our face. It's all about you. That's what the culture sets you up for. In fact, recently, the Lego company, they did a national survey of children to ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like most of us, whenever we were little kids, like we wanted to be police officers or astronauts or firemen. Maybe we even dreamed to become the president of the United States of America. Hey, no kid wants that job anymore. <laughs> Definitely not. Do you know what the number one thing Kids wanted to be when they grew up, YouTube stars. That's what they wanted to be. They wanted to be YouTube stars. They were like, hey, I just need a cell phone and um, I just take some pictures of me, put them on the internet, and then I'm just gonna make a whole bunch of money playing with other people's toys. Like, that just blows my mind, right? It blows my mind that kids these days, they're just gonna, they're, they don't wanna play with toys, they wanna watch other people play with toys. I'm like, that's not how these things work, but nevertheless, I'm old, I don't get it. So, so that's the number one thing. Children wanted to be not police officers, not astronauts, not, not firemen, they wanted to be YouTube stars. They wanted to be celebrities celebrities. One in four millennials, when surveyed by Forbes magazine, they said they would quit their job today if they could become famous. Okay, we live in a world that's obsessed with self, that we've become selfish, self-centered, self-consumed. It's all about self-grandizing, and all of our selfies have really left us feeling self-loathing. Okay, how many of you think that this is working? Okay, do you think this is working, the society and the culture that we live in? Okay, if you think it's working, it's because you've been self-deceived. Okay, more so than ever before, people are hurting, suffering, and struggling. Okay, one in five adults today suffer from some form of a mental illness, that people are really hurting. In the last 10 years, depression has increased 5%, anxiety-related illnesses have increased 2%, and people with stress-related um, problems has increased 3%. Me and some of our staff members, we were talking about this, and just in the last 20 years, the suicide rate in America has increased 30%. Just think about it. People are hurting, people are suffering, people are struggling, and I'm not saying that the direct correlation is there, but the trends are showing, as soon as the iPhone came out, this is basically the world we live in. It's not working. And you wonder, how did we get here? How did all of this play out the way that it is? Okay, back in the 1980s, there was a thing called the self-esteem movement. 
Okay, many of us, we grew up in the self-esteem movement. Okay, for those of you who are in the older generation and you're like, I just don't understand kids these days. All of these young kids coming into the workforce, they're so entitled and narcissistic and you know, they think they're special little snowflakes and they get a trophy just for showing up. Like you ever say that? Okay, just remember you are the ones who are giving them all trophies as kids, okay? Gotcha. The self-esteem movement taught our parents this, that if you want to have successful, well-adjusted, healthy children, here's what you do. Never let them fail. Tell them how inherently great they are and let them know that they're special. Okay, the problem with that is we all grew up, we failed, and we don't feel very special. Okay, because it's not working. Amen? Amen? So, so what do we do? Society has failed us. Culture has failed us. And our parents, though they loved us and did their best, even they failed us. We were not prepared for the world that we live in. That people are hurting, people are struggling, people are selfish and self-centered. So where do we go? How do we get over this narcissistic, totally entitled, selfish culture that we live in? Where do we go? Where do we turn? to the Gospel of Mark. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter nine, starting in verse 30. Jesus is going to tell us something that nobody ever told us before, that the greatest blessing is actually found in humility. We're gonna talk about humility today. Now, humility is hard, but I believe that the hardest lessons can lead to your greatest blessings. And so today, Jesus is going to teach us over humility. How many of you are humble? Okay, now how many of you want to learn from Jesus how to humble yourself? Okay, today, Jesus is going to teach us that. We're going to see three things. The sermon title is called Jesus and Humility. We're going to see three lessons. We're going to see three stories. And then we're going to see three teachings from Jesus on this subject of humility. Okay, here we go. Starting in verse 30, the first thing is this. If you want to learn humility, then here's what you need to do. You need to learn about the cross. Here's where we see. Starting in verse 30, they, that's Jesus and his disciples, went on from there and passed through Galilee. If you've been hanging out with us in the Gospel of Mark, you know that this section of Mark that we're studying is Jesus going out of his way. So the opening sermon in this series, Jesus goes from Galilee. He travels with his disciples up into the region of Caesarea Philippi in the Decapolis. It's a Gentile pagan area where he's revealing his true nature to his disciples, and now that time of his ministry is over, and Jesus begins his journey towards Jerusalem. So he's leaving Caesarea Philippi, he's coming in through the area of Galilee, he's going to go to Capernaum, and he's working his way down to Jerusalem, and he's on the way, he did not want anyone to know, very important. Why? For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the son of man, that's Jesus, is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise, but they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Here, we've entered into a brand new section in the life and the ministry of Jesus. Thus far, nine chapters in the Gospel of Mark has taken place in two and a half years. Okay, the rest of the book takes place in six months. Okay, Mark, he's really going to pick up the pace. He's going to start moving a whole lot faster. The first two and a half years was revealing who Jesus is. He comes, he preaches, he taught, he healed, he cast out demons, got in fights with Pharisees. He fed a large multitude of people with just a, a lunchable. He walks on water without a boat. Like, that's Jesus. And it's all been public that he has done public ministry in the marketplace, on the countryside, on a hillside. He's done it from a boat. He's done it in synagogues. It's by and large been a public ministry of Jesus. But the public ministry of Jesus is over. So we're not going to see any more public feedings and healings or any of those things. For the rest of the book, Jesus is going to be doing one-on-one -on -one interaction, personal discipleship with those who follow after him. He doesn't want anyone to know. Why? It says here in verse 31, if you have your Bible, you can look down at verse 31. It says this, for he was teaching his disciples. He's, he's teaching them. And what we see in this next section that we're going to be studying in Mark, because if you're new to redemption, here's what we got to understand, that at our church, we preach straight through books of the Bible. That's our way. 
Okay, we just preached, we just preached the Bible. So back in 2017, I believe, we opened up the Gospel of Mark and we've been in it ever since. Like that's just how we do things. So we start in chapter one, verse one, we work our way, and then maybe by the time Jesus comes back, we'll finish this, this book. But either way, like we just study one book. And here's why it's so beautiful doing that. It's because you see how every story is really building to be a part of the greater story. And so what we're seeing is this, is that Jesus, he, here he is teaching his disciples because he wants them to understand what to expect after Jesus goes to the cross and gives his life. He's trying to prepare them for what ministry is supposed to be. But the disciples, they, they don't get it. They still don't understand it. Okay, this isn't the first time that Jesus actually told his disciples about the cross. Actually, he tells us a little bit more about it in Mark chapter 8. Here, here's what we see in Mark chapter 8, 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, he will rise again. Jesus already told him, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to die. I'm going to be delivered over. I'm going to be crucified, executed, buried. And then three days later, I'm going to resurrect. I'm going to rise again. And the disciples, they didn't get it. He told him again in Mark chapter nine, he's telling them about the, the death that he's going to experience. And then here's what they say. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising of the dead might mean. We see that he's trying to prepare his disciples because Jesus knows. I will not be with you forever, and you need a lot of help. Like, you guys just don't get it. Like, you're not the brightest bulbs in the box. Like, you guys have been given some headaches for me along the way. I need you to really get this because if you miss this, we're in a lot of trouble. Okay? Here's what you need to learn you need to learn about the cross. He's teaching about the cross. And so in this series, we're looking at last week, Jesus is teaching them about spiritual warfare, right? So the verse before, it's about demons. He said, I need you to get ready. Spiritual warfare is real. You can't live on the mountain forever. Okay, you're going to come down and find yourself in a war. So, you know, put your boots on, get ready for battle, right? Warfare is real. The next week, we're going to see about sin and hell. And then after the jump in the, in the month of January, we're going to look at um, marriage and divorce and children and faith and family. And we're going to see all of these different personal one-on-one -on -one teachings from Jesus directly to the disciples. But today, today Jesus is going to teach them about, about humility. Now, why do you think Jesus would teach them about humility. Why is it so important for the disciples to learn humility? Okay, here's the reason why. Because if all you do is think about yourself, you're going to miss out on what he wants to do. If all you do is think about yourself, you're going to miss out on what he wants to do in you and through you and for you. Here's the big idea. Here's the big idea. That if you want to think about yourself less, then you need to think about the cross more. If you want to think about yourself less, then you need to think about the cross more. When you find yourself at a place in your life where you're thinking about yourself, it's because you're no longer thinking about the cross. When you find yourself in a place where you're only looking at yourself, it's because you're no longer looking at the cross. When you reach a place in your life where you're only focused on yourself, it's because you've taken your eyes and you've taken your focus off of him and off of the cross. The disciples, they didn't get it, and so they needed Jesus to tell them one more time. Because if you think about yourself less, then you're going to be thinking about the cross more. And over and over again, for the remainder of the Gospel of Mark, here's what Jesus is going to be doing. He's going to be telling them about the cross. Why? Because if you want to think about yourself less, then you need to think about the cross more. The cross is so much more than just fire insurance that saves us from hell. The cross is so much more than just an open door for you to get into heaven. The cross is so much more than just a sermon to be told on Easter Sunday. The cross is so much more than just a story for you to tell your children. The cross is so much more than just decoration. The cross is so much more than just a fleeting fashion statement. The cross is the declaration of God's love to the world. 
The cross is God's plan from before the foundations of the world to redeem all people unto himself. The cross is God's plan A. There is no plan B. The cross is what God had set his heart towards before we were ever made. The cross is God's way of showing us who he is and what he does. If you want to know what love is, if you want to know who God is, then you learn about the cross. Do you want to learn what humility is? Well, then look to Jesus as he gives his life on a cross. That Jesus Christ is the second member of the Trinity. He is eternally God, very God of very God. He is the image of the invisible God. And he lays aside his divinity and he puts on humanity and he goes to the cross. That Jesus would give up his rights of his divinity and that he would humble himself, taking on the form of a servant and he would go to the cross. That Jesus would live as we live and he would go to the cross. That Jesus would suffer as we suffer suffer and he would go to the cross that Jesus would do all of that without sin so that through him our sins can be forgiven and he would do that all at the cross and that he would resurrect from the grave and he would give you a new life that you could never earn and that all started at the cross if you want to learn about humility then all you got to do is look to Jesus and how he lived and who he is and you want to learn about humility then you learn that at the cross It's all found at the cross. Do you want to know about the character of God? You learn about it at the cross. Do you want to learn about the wisdom of God? You learn about that at the cross. Do you want to learn about the justice of God? You learn about that at the cross. Do you want to learn about the the forgiveness of God, that your sins have been erased? They're cast as far as the east is to the west. He doesn't hold them over you anymore, that you have been forgiven. You learn about that at the cross. Do you want to learn what it means to be loved by God, that there is no height nor depth that can separate you from the love of God, you learn about that at the cross. Do you want to learn what it means to be redeemed by God, that he doesn't see your sins, that you're covered by the blood of Jesus, and that when God sees you, he sees his son? Do you want to learn what it means to be redeemed, that, that, that you're a new creation, the old is gone, and the new has come, you've been made brand new by him, you learn that at the cross. Do you want to learn what it means that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? You learn that at the cross. Do you want to know what it means that, that, that greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world? You learn that at the cross. Do you want to know what it means that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you? You learn that at the cross. If God be for me, then who can be against me? You learn that at the cross. Do you want to know how to overcome that sin that's haunting you, those temptations that are plaguing you? Do you know how to get over the guilt and shame, that condemnation that keeps following you? You get over that at the cross. Do you want to know what it means that you have a brand new identity, that you are not who people said that you are? You are who he says you are. are. You want to know and learn how you get that? You get that at the cross. Do you want to learn what it means that you don't have to be who you used to be? You don't have to do the things you used to do. You don't have to act the way you used to act. You've been made new. You're brand new. You learn that at the cross. I'm still going. Do you want to know what it means that you have a new community where people love you and you can walk through these doors and you can be welcomed and you can find a place that you can call home and you don't have to hide anymore? Do you know where you find that? You find that at the foot of the cross. Do you want to know what life change through Jesus looks like? It looks like men and women and children gathered together on their knees learning about the cross. It's found at the cross. May we never be a church that graduates beyond the cross. May we never be a people who think we've matured to the point that we don't need the cross anymore. May we be a people who humble ourselves daily at the foot of Jesus and we look and we love and we learn what it means to be humbled, that we learn what it means to be at the cross.
See, the Apostle Paul, he understands this. Several years later, he's planting churches in regions very similar to the culture that we live in. One of the churches is in Corinth. Now, Corinth was a very popular port city that people were everywhere, and they proud, they prided themselves on having the latest technology and the coolest fads, and they knew the best names and the greatest philosophies. They were proud and they were an arrogant, self-centered, self-righteous culture. And the Apostle Paul has the work to start a brand new church in this region. And you know what he's going to tell these Corinthians who who are proud and think about themselves all the time? Do you know what he's going to tell them? Here's what he tells them. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. If you don't understand this, if it doesn't make sense, the cross looks like weakness. Why would one man die for the whole world? I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. I thought to be great, you had everybody come serve you. How could you be great by serving other people? I don't understand it. The cross looks like foolishness to a world that is perishing. But for you and for me and for those of us who understand the cross, Paul says this, that it is the power of God in our lives. Paul says this. He says, if I could only preach one sermon for the rest of my life, If I could only tell you one thing for the rest of my life, if I only had one message to share for the remainder of my days, here's what I would tell you about. I would tell you about the cross. Here's what I would teach over. I would teach about the cross because here's what I want you to understand. I want you to understand the purpose of the cross in your life. Because when you think about the cross more, you'll think about yourself less. Do you want to know what God's plan for your life is? Think about the cross. Do you want to know what God's purpose for your life is? You find that at the cross. Do you want to know the power of God moving and working and blessing and flowing in your life? Do you want to learn all of those things? Well, then learn about the cross. It's all about the cross. It's the whole reason that Jesus came to give his life so that you and me would be forgiven, and we find that at the cross. There's a lot of things you can learn. There's a lot of big, fancy college words, and you can memorize the glossaries in the back of the textbook. There's a lot of things you can learn, but learn most and learn well about the cross. Because if you think about the cross more, well, then you'll think about yourself less. In your life, if your eyes are on yourself, it's because you've taken your eyes off of the cross. If you're focused on yourself, it's because you've stopped focusing on the cross. If you're thinking about yourself, it's because you stopped thinking about the cross. If you want to think about yourself less, think about the cross more. Which leads us to the second point. If you want to learn to be humble, then you got to learn how to serve others. Here's what he says in verse 33. And they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them. So Jesus is going to ask his disciples a question. And I love it. It's amazing. What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silence. For on the way, they argued with one another about who was going to be the greatest. Bum, 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 bum. Busted. Jesus got him. They're arguing, who's the greatest? And Jesus is like, I heard that. Now, this is a dumb question, right? Because obviously, who do you think the greatest is? It's him. It's the guy who can walk on water. Like, he is the greatest. Like, he came from heaven, right? You came from Nazareth. Like, it's not the same thing at all. Like, okay. I love this because it just shows how real the disciples are. Like, if you don't read your Bible and laugh a little bit, like, you're not reading it correctly. Like, the Bible is funny. Now, it's a British humor, okay, but it's, it's, it's still humor, all right? So, so basically, here's what. So they're, they're going from Caesarea Philippi down towards Jerusalem. He goes through Galilee, but he didn't want anybody to know, and now he's making a pit stop in Capernaum. So I just imagine that they're being like super ninja-like along this trip. Like they don't want anybody to know they're going. So they're just tiptoeing through Galilee, kind of hiding in the shadows, trying to make it down to Capernaum without anybody noticing. And then, you know, I just imagine Jesus being up front and the disciples, they're a little bit further behind and they're like whispering and arguing, you know, and they're just like, who's going to be the greatest? It's going to be me. It's going to be me. I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. Right? I just imagine Peter's like, it's me. 
I'm the greatest, right? I mean, Moses and Elijah and Peter, aren't you glad I'm here, right? And the transfiguration, you guys remember that? It was like two weeks ago. Peter's like, I'm going to build some tents. Like, I'm a, Jesus is going to need me. I'm the greatest. And then I just imagine Thomas is like, I doubt I'm the greatest. <laughs> <sighs> no, I just doubt it's going to happen. You know, I just imagine you know, Thaddeus is like, no, guys, I'm the greatest. Just wait. Everybody's going to hear about me. I'm going to be the most famous disciple. It's me, Thaddeus. People are like, is he even a disciple? Like, I don't even know that guy. <laughs> like, do you go here, Thaddeus? Like, I don't even know. And then Bartholomew's like, hey, guys, I can do stuff too. And they're like, Bartholomew, we love you. Nobody's naming their kid after you, buddy. <laughs> And they're arguing about who's the greatest, and then Judas is like, hey, I got Jesus back, right? That's me. I got... They're like, Judas. (laughs) Nobody's naming their kid after you either. (laughs) So so they're they're arguing about who the greatest is going to be, and I love this. You know, here's what Jesus does. How many of you would think Jesus is going to rebuke him right here? Hey, dum-dum, sit down. I'm the greatest, right? But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't rebuke them. He just redirects them. Okay, aspiring for greatness is not bad. There's nothing wrong with aspiring for greatness. Okay, like how many of you want to be an okay dad? You're like, hey, at least I'm like, okay. <laughs> How many of you want to be a great dad? Yeah. How many of you want an average heart surgeon? <laughs> no, you don't want that, right? How many of you want your pilots to have a core value of audacious mediocrity? <laughs> Nobody? Nobody? See, aspiring for greatness is not bad, but their definition of greatness was wrong. See, they thought greatness is when other people serve you. Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Greatness is when you serve others. See, true greatness is not what others can do for you. True greatness is what you do for others. True greatness is humility. And so Jesus is going to teach them about humility. He says, if you want to be humble, okay, then you need to learn how to serve others. He doesn't rebuke them. He redirects them. Check this out. It's fascinating. And then he sat down and he called the 12. That's a teaching position. He's a teacher. He sits down and he begins teaching them. And he said to them, if anyone will be first, he must be last and the servant of all. Jesus says, if you want to be first, you got to come in last. And if you want to be the greatest, then you need to learn how to serve others. This is totally different than what we see in the world. Amen? So here's what we see in verse 36. He takes, he takes a child, and he put him in the midst of him and take him in his arms. He said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Jesus is essentially saying this. If you want to be great, and there's nothing wrong with you wanting to be great, go ahead, strive for greatness, pursue greatness, have a desire to do great things. We want your life to matter. I want your life to count. I want for you to make a difference, but you need a better definition of greatness. Okay, if you want to be great, here's what you do. You learn to serve others as if you were serving me. That's what greatness is. That you serve others as if you were serving me. That's how you make a difference. That's how you make your life count. He doesn't rebuke them. He redirects them. And then here's what's so fascinating. He's going to give them an object lesson. Okay, great teachers, they come up with object lessons. I didn't come up with one today. But Jesus says, okay, hey, let's bring the kid in here. Okay, let's bring the kid in here. He brings a little child. We'll name him Charlie. So here you go. Here's, here's Charlie. Okay, we're going to have a competition to see who the greatest is. Okay, hey, Charlie, can you help me with that? Charlie's like, uh, yes, sir. Okay, so Charlie, Charlie has a dirty diaper. Okay, first one to change the diaper is the greatest. Let's go. I'm like, but I want to change a diaper. Okay, if you can't change the diaper, you won't change the world. That's just what Jesus says. <laughs> he says, let's change the diaper. Nobody wants to do that. Whoever can take care of this child is the greatest. 
See, Charlie here, he, 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 he's got like fudge sickle on his face. So we're gonna get some wipies. Make sure we wipe him down really good. You know, his mom's a single mom, and so she's been working a lot of overtime, and you're gonna need, we're gonna need to take care of Charlie. Whoever can do that is the greatest. Could you, could you do that for me? Because, I mean, he's, you know, his lunchtime's coming up, and he's got, like, he's got this weird food aversion. He only eats chicken nuggets, so we're going to have to get him some chicken nuggets. Okay, and then, you know, we're going to have to get him ready for bed, so you got to, you know, give him a bath first, and he, he likes his little Aquaman toy, so you got to make sure you can find the Aquaman toy, and then give him a nice little bubble bath, and afterwards, get him in his jam jams. You got to take him outside to see the stars first, and then you bring him upstairs, and then he's got to brush his teeth, and then he wants, you know, you to brush your teeth with him, because that's just the way he does things, and, you know, he's really particular about, and then you got to get him his jam jams, tuck him in, kiss him on the forehead, say prayers with him, and then once you turn off the light, go downstairs and do the dishes for mommy because she's tired. Okay, that's true greatness. And all the ladies said, amen. amen. <laughs> if you want to be great, you got to take care of this child. I just imagine the disciples are like, there's no glory in that. Exactly. And that's, that's what you get for being the greatest. You take care of the kids. If you want to be the greatest, you got you to serve others. Here's basically what Jesus is saying. You ready? If serving is beneath you, then greatness is beyond you. Hey, that felt good. Can I say it again? If serving is beneath you, then greatness is beyond you. Okay, here's what Jesus is saying. Say, so what does the child represent? In that day, children had nothing they could offer you. All right, children today, they're like, we love children. I have a dad. I got two daughters. Okay, I mean, I got one daughter. Her name's Esther's son. I got another daughter named Ruth Moon. She's going to be here in like two weeks, so y'all pray for me. And I love, I love my girls. And I would do anything for my girls. I mean, they're so amazing. They're like little gods that live in my house and make me late for everything. <laughs> right. I love them. And my daughters are a blessing to me. How many of you are parents? You love, you love your kids, right? Your kids are a blessing. Now, in those days, children weren't really considered a blessing. Children back then were more of a burden, because think about it. One in three children died during childbirth. Most children didn't make it past the age of five. And so children weren't a blessing. They were a burden who you didn't want to get too attached to them because then they could just break your heart. They couldn't make you any money. They couldn't, you know provide any income. They couldn't fertilize the field or reap any crops. Basically, all you did was just take care of them all the time, and it really prevented you. And so children, they, they weren't really considered a blessing. They were considered a burden, and there was nothing they could offer society, and that's the reason Jesus brings them in and says, this is what true greatness looks like. It looks like serving people who can't give you anything in return. See, so often, because of our pride, we want to surround ourselves with people who can benefit us. So we say, oh, I like you, and I like you, and I have something I can get from you, and I'll serve here as long as you can do this for me, quid pro quo. I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back. That's just the deal we have. Look how humble we are. Okay, that's not humility. Okay, that's, that's pride masquerading as humility, but that's not humility. Okay, humility is serving others who can't give you anything else in return. See, the disciples are like, Jesus, there's no business cards for child watcher, take her care of her. There's nothing we get out of this. There's no, there's, no, there, there's no success. There's no guarantee of glory. There's nothing I can get out of this. And Jesus says, exactly. Do you want your life to matter? Do you want to make a difference? Do you want to change the world? Change the diaper. And do it as if you're doing it unto me. I wish more Christians would understand this. Like, I wish more churches would understand this. Like, the way that we do church is so backwards than the way Jesus was discipling his followers. I mean, could you just imagine if Peter, coming from here, he, he didn't do this through the book of Acts, if he's like, oh, I'm supposed to preach Pentecost today? <clears throat> just don't really feel like it. Could you imagine what it would be like if in Acts chapter 4, when they're all getting beaten with whips and thrown in prison, they're like, oh, I did, I'm tired. I don't feel like preaching the gospel today. 
What would it look like if when Paul got knocked off his horse and the Holy Spirit said, go to Ananias' house, and Ananias, in Acts chapter 9, he's like, what? What's his name? Saul? Paul? Um, no. Uh, just, I just don't really feel like having company over today. I'm just not really feeling like getting up. What would happen if that's what the early church looked like? You and you and you and you and you. None of you would be here if they didn't learn how to serve. What if everyone in your church served the same way you serve? That's a scary question, isn't it? Like, it's, conviction just hit real hard, didn't it? Like, I, I wish people would understand this. Like, I, I really do. Because what we do is this. So often is we pick and choose churches based on what they can do for you. Okay, oh, what ministry does this church have? What opportunities does this church have? Oh, what, what kind of programs does this church have? Does this church have an underwater basket weaving group? Because that's really what I'm into. Oh, they have a rock wall. There's a bouncy castle. Like, what can they offer for me? And then we pick our churches based on what they can do for you and never once consider that maybe, maybe God's brought you here for them that there's other people in the room, stop just thinking about you, that he has gifts, he has plans, he has purpose, he has talents that he has given you, and if all you do is fill a chair, you waste it on yourself instead of using it for the kingdom of God around you. I mean, just think about it. We pick churches like, oh, uh, does this pastor funny? No, he's not funny. He's actually really convicting. I don't like this. <laughs> I think he's talking about me. Oh, the park, I have to walk across the street? Oh, that's too far. I didn't get my cardio in since the 90s. I just can't do it. <laughs> they have donuts. Oh, they're Kroger donuts. <laughs> Never coming back here again. Oh, they have coffee. It's community coffee. He works at community. <laughs> Never coming back here again. Oh, they want me to serve? No, I couldn't do that. Then what am I going to do for the rest of my Sunday? They want me to join a community group. Are you serious? I need to prioritize my discipleship and do life with other people? Really? No, nah, I'm an individual. They want, they want me to join? I'll join the pastor's community group. Oh, I got put in Jeff Brown's community group? <sighs> he smells like patchouli. I don't want to go. <laughs> You can't make me. They're passing the offering. They're taking up an offering seriously. And you know what? This pastor, like, he just, he talks, last week he talked about demons. Like, that's just scary. And the next week he's going to talk about hell. And I just, I don't think that I could do that. And you know, actually, he's not that funny. In fact, I think he's making fun of me right now. And I don't think I'm going to come back here again. And then you're going to go to the next church. And then that pastor's going to offend you. And then you're going to go to the next church. And then that one's going to offend you. And there's not going to be a ministry for you. And then you're going to figure out, oh, maybe the problem isn't the churches, maybe the problem is me. Because you're still thinking about you. God has placed you wherever you are, whether it's redemption or praise or encounter or, you know, first Baptist, second Baptist, third Baptist, whatever Methodist church you go to. <laughs> God has you there for a reason, and he wants you to be able to use your gifts to love and bless and learn to serve others. Yeah. It doesn't have to be redemption. I like redemption. I'm going to be here. I'd love to see you here. But there's 200 other churches that are doing a really great job in our area. Just find one and serve it. Amen. Give your life to it and watch God begin to grow. Right? Okay, how many of you next week, if Jesus was preaching, you would be here? Like, if, if Jesus is preaching, right? If Jesus is here, you're like, I'm going to be there. If Jesus is there, right? You're like, it's a lot better than this joker up here right now. <laughs> Right. How many of you would serve next week if we asked you, like, Jesus is preaching? Could you guys show up? Like, we need to make it look real good if Jesus is going to be here. You're like, I'm confirming on Planning Center and everything. Like, you can count on me. They'd be like, hey, do you want to go to the pumpkin patch next week? No, Jesus is coming. I got to be at church. <laughs> okay. And you're like, I'm serving. I'm serving. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to help him park his camel. <laughs> or donkey, depending on which side of the mark you're on. <laughs> and, and, and he's got a little kid named Charlie who's coming, so um, I'm going to make sure that Charlie gets checked into kids' ministry really nice, and then I'm going to run slides for Jesus' sermon, 
And uh, I'm gonna be front row, because I wanna be in the presence of Jesus when I worship. So I'm gonna be front row. I'm ready, I'm ready. How many of y'all would be here next week if Jesus was here? You're like, I'm serving, right? Okay, well, if you're not serving now, you wouldn't do it then. Because here's what Jesus says. Here's what Jesus says. Whoever does one for these children has done it for me. True greatness is serving as if you are serving Jesus without expecting anything else in return. When you serve, you're really serving him. And if you're not doing it now, you won't do it then. See, if serving is beneath you, it's because greatness is beyond you. Do you want your life to matter? Do you want to make a difference? Do you want your life to count? Do you want to change the world? Sign up in Redemption Kids and start changing some diapers. That's how you make a difference. That's exactly what Jesus says. He says, serve others as if you were serving me. If you want to learn humility, learn to serve others. Which leads us to the final point. We're all convicted by now. <laughs> learn to celebrate other people's success. That's the, that's the third point. When other people succeed, how do you respond? Learn to celebrate other people's success. I love this. This is amazing. Okay, John said to him, Jesus, great, great story. I got something. Jesus, check this out. We saw someone casting out demons and we stopped them because he was not following us. Does that sound humble? It doesn't sound very humble. Hey, is, it, is casting out demons a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it depends if you're the demon or not, but I would say it's a good thing. Okay, is stopping people from casting out demons a good thing or a bad thing? Again, depends if you're the demon or not. But I'm going to go with it's a bad thing. Now, here's the disciples. Like, get this, right? So, they're walking, and they see someone casting out demons, and they're like, he's not one of us. We're the 12. He can't be casting out demons. That's us. We got to do something about it. And so they go, and they stop the guy who's casting out the demons. They're like, Jesus, aren't you proud of us? And Jesus is like, no. Like, that's not how this works. Right? And just think about it. Okay, again, another point for expositional preaching. What was the problem last week? What was the big problem last week? The disciples failed to cast out the demon. The big problem was they failed to cast out the demon. And now they run into somebody who's being successful casting out demons, and they stop them. They're like, Jesus, we stopped them. You're like, don't. Like, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. And they became jealous, and they were no longer able to celebrate the success of other people. They're like, if we can't cast out demons, ain't nobody casting out demons. Right? If we can't be happy, ain't nobody being happy. Okay? If we can't be successful, ain't nobody being successful. Like, to me, this is so crazy that, that just, this is, the, this is basically the same thing. Like, like, the disciples are like, okay, we got to stop this guy from casting out demons. That would be the same thing as us saying, Praise Church just had their major move in their brand new sanctuary, and I think that God's really going to bless it. Let's go pull the fire alarm so nobody goes. It's the same thing. I mean, Encounter Church just launched a second location. Really? Let's start spreading rumors and gossiping about them so nobody wants to go there. I wish more churches would understand this too. It's ridiculous to see the church fighting against the church. It's ridiculous to see disciples fighting against disciples. It's ridiculous when Christians can't celebrate God blessing another person. When God blesses someone else, how do you respond? I mean, just, just look at this. Jesus is going to answer him. Here, here's what Jesus says. Uh, John, do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will soon be afterward able to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Here are the disciples, instead of rejoicing, okay, they get jealous. Okay, instead, of, instead of praising God, they start comparing themselves to other people. Okay, do you want to know the reason why many of us are so miserable? It's because we compare ourselves to other people. Do you want to know the reason why you feel unsatisfied and unfulfilled? It's because you're always looking at somebody else's life, and you're always comparing yourself to other people. 
And so whenever somebody gets something that you don't have, you become jealous. Jealousy is a sign of immaturity, which really goes to show that you still lack humility. Right? If you can't celebrate the success of other people, then you have not yet learned how to be humble. Like when somebody gets a job at work, or you're like, they don't deserve that job. I deserve that job. Or when somebody gets the pay raise or the promotion, or you're like, I can't believe they got that promotion. Or when somebody gets engaged, you're like, how did she say yes to that? Have you seen his mustache? Really? How did he say yes to that? Oh my, I, and I'm still single? They went to game one of the World Series? No way. I had to watch the World Series from my couch with my grandma. <laughs> I posted that same meme on Facebook last week, and they got 100 likes, and I only got one, and it was my grandma. <laughs> I'm so jealous, I can't believe it. I'm cuter than them, I got a better beard than them, I'm more successful than them, I'm funnier than them, and they get, oh, they're so, I can't even stand it. And then you become, you become jealous. And the reason why is because you, you haven't learned to celebrate other people's success. If you don't celebrate other people's success, you will always feel like a failure in your life. You haven't learned to celebrate other people's success. So here's what you do instead. The disciples should have learned this. Stop comparing and start celebrating. Celebrate what God is doing in someone else's life instead of always comparing yourself to them. What would your life look like if you learned to say this? You got the promotion? Way to go, man. Way to go. Good for you. I see you work hard here every single week. It's about time, corporate tech notice. Good for you, man. Oh, she said yes. Praise the Lord, bro. Praise. We've been praying for you for a long time. I can't believe she actually said yes. You're going to have to give me some pointers. You're going to have to give me some tips because Lord knows like, I got some boys who they're going to need some of that help over here. So w w good for you. Great job. Good stuff. Hey, what would, it be ha what would happen if, if you're like, hey, I'm proud of you with out throwing up a little bit when you say it. Could you do that? Could you, could you do that? What would your life look like? I'm telling you what, you'd be a lot happier if you had humility. Because then you would stop comparing yourself to other people and you would start celebrating what God is doing in their lives. I personally believe that God is doing miracles all around us. And the reason that we don't see them is because we're looking at ourselves. See, these people are casting out demons and the disciples are unsuccessful and they're not seeing the miracles because they want to stop them because they weren't one of them. I believe that God's doing miracles all around us. This couple right here, total miracle. Two and a half years ago, strung out on drugs, homeless. Today, he's got his own business. And God's restored his children to him. Miracle. You'll miss that if all you do is think about yourself. Marriage totally restored. Couple separated, now married, healthier than ever before. Miracles all around us. What God is doing, people addicted to drugs have been delivered, children who have been saved. We had one girl, one woman who came to worship last night. She told me in between services that she'd been praying for her daughter to come back to the Lord for, for I don't even know how long. And then last night in worship night, the Lord spoke to her and said, don't just pray for your daughter, pray for her boyfriend. So she said a prayer for her boyfriend, sent him a text. They were in the first service today. Don't tell me God don't answer prayers. couple, the doctor said, you will never have babies. Now the baby's in redemption, kids. Don't tell me God don't answer prayers. But here's the problem is if all you do is think about yourself, you're going to miss out on what God's doing in our body. Stop comparing yourselves to others and start celebrating what God is doing in the life of other people. That's what humility looks like. And some of you are still wondering, like, okay, but, but, but God's just not blessing me. You're still feeling that. You're still feeling that. Maybe, just maybe, now I'm your pastor, I love you. Maybe, just maybe, the reason that God is not blessing you is because he's trying to teach a lesson to you. The hardest lessons lead to the greatest blessings. And so you have a lesson that he wants to teach you. And that lesson, I believe, is humility. That you would stop thinking about yourself and you would start thinking about him, 
and you would start thinking about others, and that'll put you in a position to where you can receive the blessings of God for your life. The hardest lessons lead to the greatest blessing. How many of you have ever had God humble you? It's humbling, isn't it? Especially for the guy with the lights and the microphone telling everybody how to be humble. (laughs) Very humbling. Now, the truth is this. God don't mind humbling you. He would just prefer you learn to humble yourself. God will humble you. It's going to happen. But he would prefer that you learned to humble yourself. Was Jesus humble? Yes. If you want to know what humility is, look to Jesus. Jesus was humble. Were the disciples humble? No. Who's the greatest? Yeah. So they needed Jesus to humble them. God don't mind humbling you. He would just prefer that you learn to humble yourself. Now, here's the deal. The greatest blessings come from hard lessons. But I believe that if we as a church and you as an individual will learn how to be humble, then you will see the blessings of God on your life like never before. Just let me share with you what the Bible actually teaches over the subject of humility. Here's what he says in Psalm 149. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Do you want God to take pleasure in you? Do you want God to delight in you? Do you want God, when he looks at you, say, wow. Is that what you want God to say when he sees you? Guess how you get that? Humility. You want salvation, forgiveness of your sins? That comes from humility. That the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Do you want God to have pride in you instead of you having pride in yourself? Guess where that comes from? That comes from humility. Proverbs 11.2 says this, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. Another translation says destruction, but with the humble, there is wisdom. Do you know why everything's falling apart and you're working so hard and you're failing and striving and struggling and every this thing's not making sense? Do you know why? Because of pride. That it's all about you and what you do and how you live and what you want, and it's not about him. And pride leads to disgrace, and it leads to destruction, but with the humble, there is wisdom. Do you want to know God's plan? Do you want to know God's mind? Do you want to get God's heart? Do you want to know what God's thinking? Be humble, and God will reveal his will to you. James, three, James 4, 6 says this, but God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. That word oppose in the Greek, what it says is that he holds his hand against. He says, I don't like it. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to be around it. I don't want pride anywhere near me. That he actually holds you at arm's length. He's saying, get away, get away. I can't stand to be around you and your pride. And then he's looking around. Oh, and then he sees somebody who's humble. He says, get in here. I give grace to the humble. I oppose the proud. I give grace to the humble. You want to be in my presence? Humble yourself. You want to be near me? Humble yourself. You want to come and be with me? Humble yourself. You want to know who I am? You want to know what I do? You want to be saved by me? You want some grace? You want some mercy? You want some wisdom? You want the unmerited favor of God in your life? Humble yourself, and it's all yours. Isn't this so backwards from the world that we live in when one in four people want to become famous and kids want YouTube channels and everybody's taking pictures of themselves so they can double tap their stupid face and everybody's all about me and what I want and what I get and what I need and what you can do for me and how you can bless me and how you can serve me and everybody's miserable because they're all thinking about themselves and you're spending money you don't have to buy things you don't need to impress people you don't like and everybody's popping pills and everybody's griping and complaining and everybody else, our windows are rolled up, our doors are locked, we have have no friends. Maybe we're the ones who have it backwards. Maybe, maybe Jesus knows what he's talking about when he says, if you want to be first, get at the back of the line. If you want to be the greatest, serve some kids who can't give you anything else in return. That's what true greatness is. That's what humility is. So how many of you will say, I'm humble? Now, how many of you would say, I want to learn how to humble myself? If that's you, I got five simple ways for you to be humble. (laughs) The first thing is this, repent. You know, it's really hard to be proud when you're on your knees. This is repentance. 
It's really hard for you to be proud when you're on your knees. For you to say, God, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I'm not the center of the world. Please forgive me. Humility begins with repentance. Pride is not something to be managed. Pride is a sin to be repented of. Go to Jesus and say, Jesus, I am a sinner. I'm sorry. And I repent. And you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, I forgive you because not only did I die for your sin, I died for your pride. Repentance. The second thing is this, is worship. Worship him. Because when you worship him, you're not looking at you, you're looking at him. When you worship him, you're not thinking about you, you're thinking about him. God, you are so good. Lord, you are so great. You are so amazing. You are so lovely. You are so holy. God, you are eternal God, very God, and you sought from all of creation, and you saved me. Your strong hand reached down in my hard heart, and you brought me back to new life. I love you. You are so incredible and amazing, and no matter what I'm going through, it compares nothing to you. God, you are good. That's worship. And when you see him, you're not going to be looking at you. And the number three, serve. Okay, you knew this was coming. All right, I can tell how convicted you are by how many connect cards we have filled out today. <laughs> hey, everybody be signing up to serve. All right, Redemption Kids, serve. How many of you actually serve in Redemption Kids? Let me see my Redemption Kids. Hey, stand up. Let's give a big round of applause for all those who serve in Redemption Kids. You're better than all of us. <laughs> you are the greatest. If you want to be great, sign up for the serve team. We have a team night on Tuesday night. We're going to train you, talk about you, cast some vision, inspire you. But if you want to be first, you got to serve. Sign up for the serve team. You'll be first in the kingdom. You'll be the first at church, and you'll be the last one to leave every Sunday. We'll take good care of you. But... <laughs> Sign up to serve. Now, some of you immediately, you're like, but Sundays are this day. Hey, you know what? There's all different types of areas in our church that we're looking for people to serve. Redemption Kids, absolutely. But we also have greeters and parking team. And we have people back there in the sound booth right now. One girl in the sound booth, she served all last night for our serve team, for our, for our worship night. And I was kind of upset. I was like, she's not going to get a chance to worship. And she says, I love serving my church and giving people the opportunity to worship. And she served all last night for our, our worship night. And she's serving all day today from 8 a.m. to about 7 o'clock tonight. Because she's learned the secret of joy is found in humility and serving other people. Sign up to serve. You'll learn what it means. And then the next thing is this, is pray. Pray, pray, pray. Because when you pray, you get God's heart. It may not change the situation that you're in, but it'll change your heart in the middle of that situation. And so if you want to get God's heart, pray. Because then you'll have the heart of the Father. And then the last one is this, repeat. Okay. You repent you worship, you serve, you pray, and then you repeat. How long am I going to be doing this? Forever. For the rest of your life. This is all you're going to be doing. You're so glad you came to redemption today because I just gave you a life plan. Like this is all you're going to be doing for the remainder of your life. Every single day when you wake up, you're going to repent, you're going to worship, you're going to serve, you're going to pray, and then you're going to repeat. Okay, repent, Worship, serve, pray, repeat. 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 Repent, worship, serve, pray, and repeat. That's your life from here on out. Because no one can say, I'm humble, but we can all learn how to humble ourselves. And it's the hardest lessons that lead to the greatest blessings of God in your life.